From one islander to another, Isle of Wight Radio proudly presents John Hannam Meets. Hi and welcome to another John Hannam Meets. I'm delighted to say my guest today is Sue Holderness. Nice to see you, Sue. You too, very colourful as always. <laughs> well, thank you. We've uh, met each other many times over the years. Today, of course, uh, we're in Salisbury. Which, so as we speak, one of the most famous places in the world. Aren't we brave to, we to, to brave. be here with all this nerve gas? Yes. <laughs> no, it's very exciting. There's a slight tension in the town, but obviously the world's eyes are upon us. And I think people are a bit excited about it, as well as being a tiny bit nervous. Yes. Here you're in uh, a lovely show called Quartet. Yes, it's lo- it is lovely. And uh, obviously, I'm going to plug a few dates in a minute because you're going on for a few weeks, aren't you? Yes, I'd love you to mention them all. I will do. <laughs> I was trying to think the last time we met, I came to Basingstoke to see you when you were in Panto. Yes, I did Sleeping Beauty in Basingstoke, which was a... I loved doing that because it's a, it's a rather glitzy, big pantomime in Basingstoke. It's a big venue. And I was allowed to fly. Yes. And I love flying. Except the first time that they put me into the harness... They got a bit confused and I, I, I was lifted up in the wings and ready to go on. And instead of going on, I was lifted up a bit further. And then instead of going on again, I was lifted, so I found myself right up in the flies where I remained for about 20 minutes, which was a tiny bit alarming. <laughs> they hadn't quite worked out the leverage. However, I eventually came down to the right level and swung on and it never went wrong again. I must say I, I enjoyed it greatly. I'd love to fly in this, but it wouldn't really work, I don't think, in quartet. You never played Peter Pan then, years ago. No, I'm, and it's the one part I'd love to have oh. played. I'd love I'm so sad that I'm so old now. I can never forget, because it was at one of the greatest moments of my life, I was sat in a dressing room in Woking, right? Just me and four wonderful, wonderful ladies. And the ladies were the late Linda Bellingham. Great friend Jan of mine. Jan Harvey. Great friend of mine. Ruth Maddock. Great friend of mine. And you, of course. <laughs> it was a tour of the Calendar Girls. Yes, I did four tours of Calendar yeah. Girls. I, I'd have gone on touring forever because it was just so uplifting and, and, and fantastic fun and packed. I think there were ten tours went out and they were all packed. Because it, if only you could guess what plays are going to do this, we could all make a fortune. But it absolutely captured the public's imagination. They loved the story of these wonderful Women's Institute yes. ladies who got their kit off and raised millions for charity. And it was a, a very moving, touching story. But it, again, they made that very good film, which I think um, r- probably helped the tour. And, and obviously the film of Quartet, I suspect, is helping our tour. People loved that film. And so I think they want to come and see what it's like, the, seeing the, the, the four old things live on stage. You have got the wonderful Paul Nicholas. L- wonderful, very funny, very naughty man. Just Good Friends was one of the best sitcoms I've ever seen, I think, wasn't it? Yes, wasn't it lovely? And, of course, what we have in common, Paul, Nicholas and I, is the wonderful John Sullivan, because John Sullivan wrote Just Good Friends and he wrote Only Fools and Horses and he wrote The Green, Green Grass. So I have a great deal to be grateful for. John Sullivan was a big influence in my career. And Wendy Peters is here, of course. Wendy, of course, and I had worked with her before. We did the tour of the Vagina Monologues together, so it was nice to have another charm. Wendy's the baby, of course. We're all supposed to be round about 70 or older. And Wendy, who is actually 50, just birthday the other day, and it, 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 but is gloriously convincing as the, the, the dotty sissy. And Jeff Rawl, of course. And Jeff Rawl, famous, of course, for Billy Liar a million years ago, and then uh, Drop the Dead Donkey, in which he was terribly funny. So there's a lot of sitcom going on there. Uh, but all of us, really, the bulk of our careers has been in the theatre. In 1971, when you played a receptionist in Lollipop, do you remember it? Yeah, I do. Lollipop loves Mr Mole. Yes. Not many people will remember that. Shows how incredibly <laughs> old I am. Peggy Mount and Hugh Lloyd... It was a it was a wonderful series that that was that was very funny but very of its time, mm. and Gordon Jackson was wow. the uh, the doctor in this particular episode, and I was his receptionist, and Gordon Jackson who had the most illustrious film career, and 
he had never done television with a studio audience and he was absolutely terrified. This was my first ever telly, but I found myself with this hero, this icon who I'd been watching all through my childhood, sitting there shivering. And I found myself comforting him and saying, it's fine, it's just sort of, it's just sort of like, like theatre, but with, you know, but with cameras, it's going to be fine. And I said, this is ridiculous. Here I am, 22, telling Gordon Jackson not to be nervous. I have since discovered nerves myself, which is a very unpleasant thing. Did you have a burning ambition at that time, so early 70s, with first TV? What did you dream for your life, really? Well, I always rather thought I'd be Judy Dench and go into classical theatre, and very quickly it became obvious that I was that's not the direction my career was going to go. It was always going to be in comedy. And, you know, there's nothing nicer, is there? They say laughter is the best medicine, and I've I've been lucky to be in a lot of shows where... We have made people laugh. I hope we're doing it in this one. And I don't regret it because the the great thing about being in a situation comedy which is watched by lots of people, I mean, in Only Fools and Horses, our audience, we reached 26 million. You don't get that anymore. And that gives you the opportunity to go out into repertory theatres and touring companies and play some of the more serious roles that you've longed to do. In the early days, you did, yeah. Good catch my soul, didn't you? Oh, gosh, that was my second was job. Was Proby in that? PJ, PJ Proby. <laughs> and he managed not to split his trousers. Did he? Although he got into trouble a lot of times. It was a peculiar job to be working with these icons, you know, rock stars. I think here was this little actress straight out of drama school in a rock musical. It was absolutely thrilling. I played Desdemona. I had taken over from somebody else. And at that stage, I'd only done one play up there in Manchester, which was A Midsummer Night's Dream. Got straight into this wonderful leading role in a rock musical for my second job. Too thrilling. And equity in those days were very strict. You had to do 40 weeks in the provinces before you were allowed into the West End. This show was picked up, taken into the West End, and they said, you can't bring her. And the producers fought my corner, but they said, no, she's done 14 weeks' work, she can't come in. So I, I did Manchester and Birmingham, and then I was kicked out, and I went back up to Manchester to be in Pier Gint with Tom Courtney, which wasn't too bad. But it was, but it was a terribly heartbreaking thing. I, was, I thought, this is my moment for stardom, second job, and it was ripped away from me, John, ripped away. Oh, you did come to the Isle of Wight, of course. I did come to the Isle you of Wight. You were Susan Holden this then, weren't you, Bill I was, and yeah. you know, it's funny how many Susans there are out there. I was always called Susan when I'd been bad when I was little, and so suddenly in the business, everywhere I was going, people were calling me Susan, and every time I thought, what have I done wrong? So eventually I decided to change it to Sue, only because I didn't want to be made to feel as though I'd been a naughty girl every time anybody spoke to me. So I'm officially Sue Holden as now. There's some great uh, pop stars in that. That would be the day, weren't they? Really, the David day. Essex, of David course. Essex. Yeah. And the, the wonderful, Ringo Bob, Star, the wonderful yeah. Bob Lindsay was yes. in my scene, who played David Essex's best friend. And, of course, Bob Lindsay went on to do Citizen Smith, which was John Sullivan's yes. first hit sitcom. I remember the note when I did my scene opposite David Essex and the director came up and said, Sue, you've just got to look as though you fancy David Essex. <laughs> I thought, this is not a challenging role. I can do that. <laughs> he was such... He still is good, isn't he? Yeah, he still but, is good. And he was absolutely the, the prettiest, sexiest man in the world then, wasn't he? Gorgeous. Yes. He's still good looking. Very much so. When I was younger, Phyllis Dixie was a sort of a, a name yes. that wasn't talked about much, but uh, us guys knew she supposedly took her clothes off or something, didn't yes. she? Yes, I played her agent. Yes. And then we had a wonderful scene walking along this windy beach. It was a very interesting, I think it was an hour and a half, it was made like a film. It was a very good look at history in the theatre and the, that time at the, the windmill when girls were allowed to take all their clothes off but if they moved they could be got by the censors. It was fascinating and I think it was jolly well done. You did Cleopatra's in the early days, It Takes a Worried Man, The so Brief. I played, I played Cleopatra the Fourth. had to take all my clothes off, very alarming, so I made them give me a very long wig and paint me brown so that you couldn't really see anything. It wasn't a success, I'm afraid, for Cleopatra's. Colourblind, that was, was that a Catherine Cook? And I think, yes, it, it was. It yeah. was. Yes, I, 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 that was that was an interesting. The, the interesting thing, thing about the yeah. Catherine Cookson's is, of course, they are universal. Those books, and so I still get repeats. I love it. You know, you? it still gets shown all around the world. I think we've got at home the. I think there's about twenty three different, uh, virtually oh, all yes. of her stuff. All of her stuff. And uh, if um, you want, it, it was just a, a license to make money because they, 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 those books are sold all over the world, and so these these were hour long dramas were, were very successful. I know. Well, we, well, we're coming on now to Only Fools and Horses, and 
you obviously played Marlene, but it wasn't going to be a very big part initially, was it? No, she wasn't supposed to appear at all. John always loved the fact that, that there was this her indoors character, a bit like the, the Arthur Daly's her indoors. And it, he didn't really want to see Marlene. They, they, every time anybody said, well, do you remember Marlene? They, the reply was always, all the boys remember Marlene. <laughs> so he thought it must be just to have this, this, this tarty creature that we don't see. But he got the idea of a storyline where Del Boy and Rodney would look after a dog and he couldn't think where the dog would come from. And suddenly he thought, well, I suppose Boise could give Marlene a dog and then we'll send them straight off on holiday. So we don't have to see that much, we'll just have the meeting with the dog. So he wrote this brilliant little scene where Marlene comes out with this enormous Great Dane and they're going off on holiday and they hand that Great Dane over to, to the boys. It was very short. The whole thing took about an hour and I was in and out like a flash on the filming day, went home and thought, well, what a great day's work, pity it's only one day, but hey-ho. And the, the, the joy, of course, when John Sullivan rang me at home and said, we love Marlene, she's coming back. And however many years later, 35 or something, people still know me as Marlene and I couldn't be happier about that. <laughs> I went into my news agent this morning and they always say, where are you off today if I'm in there early? And as soon as I mentioned you, of course, everybody knew it, which is nice, isn't it? It's lovely. We're very lucky that it goes on being repeated all the time on Gold and there are a lot of young people. It always surprises me this, that there are a lot of young people who bravely come up and say, we, we're watching your show, we like your show. And I said, well, doesn't it sort of bother you that the telephones are the size of bricks and everything? So <laughs> they said they, they love all that. It's because this, the fundamental stories are brilliant, aren't they? There's, they've got good stories and wonderful jokes. And John Sullivan, like the best writers, can make the audience laugh and make them cry and care about the characters. So I think they are universal and can be loved by all ages. So it sort of changed your life and career, really, didn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, radically changed it yeah. because... Although it didn't take up an enormous amount of time. And in fact, Marlene didn't feature that much. I was only in, I think, 20... Oh, yeah, 20, 20 you were. 20 episodes yeah. of them all. That's quite a small number. But then, of course, green, we green had grass. the glorious joy of John Sullivan suddenly saying, what do you think of a spin-off series for Boise and Marlene? And so we had four amazingly happy years making the green, green grass. You did 32 of those, which is more than yeah, you Yeah, more, actually... than, more than, than my only fools. And... and of course, it was nice for me because it, I was very much a tiny part player in Only Fools and in Green Green Grass we had time to explore a bit more the relationship between Boise and Marley and, and just to, to just to be filming down in that wonderful bit of the country, which is where John Chalice, who plays Boise, where he lives, was just lovely. Was some of that filmed in John's house? It was. was I dreaming? Quite yeah. a lot. Was and it? in fact, I stayed in John's house, so I'd fall out of bed straight into the makeup <laughs> van and on the set. It was lovely. But originally, John and Carol said use the outside but we really rather didn't use the inside but then of course the inside was so fantastic that they allowed us to of course they did they allowed us to come inside and all the grounds of that wonderful farm we used for the farm land and it, it couldn't have been a more beautiful landscape you, you look out of the windows of John's amazing house because he lives in this medieval abbot's lodging and he's just fields acres of beautiful fields that you look over with mist rolling in the morning it's stunningly lovely we couldn't have had a better back drop to the show. It could have run longer really couldn't it? So it could have run longer we, the BBC wanted to do series 5 and John had got 5 episodes, the, the storylines ready and then suddenly all the cuts happened at the BBC and they said look this is an expensive show you, if it's called the green green grass you've got to have grass which means you've got to have filming in every single episode and taking a film crew down so they said they were going to cancel it for now and we always hoped that it would come back, that eventually those five episodes would become seven and we'd do series five. But tragedy, real tragedy, hit in 2011 when, in April, John Sullivan, at the tender age of 64, suddenly got viral pneumonia and we all thought he was recovering and then suddenly he, we just lost him. It was the most tragic thing. He was a real family man and his family were devastated, as were all of us and indeed the nation because he still had so much more that he was going to write and we of course we'll never do it now and although and funny enough his son Jim did write a lot of those episodes but I'm not sure he'd want to do it without John or, or I, I don't think people all, all keep asking if only fools and horses will come back and without John Sullivan it's just not feasible. But you and John Chalice did your own sort of Marlene and Boise, didn't you? Yes, we've, yeah. we've worked together as a team for a long time. John, of course, goes off on his own now and does his own show. 
all around the country and he's written lots of books which he sells. We're getting together a few times this year. In fact, we're going to be together on Sunday because there's an Only Fools and Horses convention in Exeter. And so a lot of us are gathering to just meet oh. the fans and sign autographs and, and say hello. It's very lovely to meet the fans because they're still so passionate about it. It's very touching. You've popped up in Casualty and Doctors more recently, haven't you? Really? Yes. I've done three or four episodes of Doctors and only one episode of Casualty. It was interesting. I talked to a lot of those young actors on Casualty. And the, the world of acting is so different now for the young people because all of them, you know, they've got good, solid contracts in casualty, but they know they're going to come to an end at some point. And every single one of them had another job they could do. Really? Either telesales or fitting kitchens or well, yeah, whatever. They've all got other jobs. They don't expect this business to pay the mortgage. I tell this story to young people or parents of young people often ask me, what does my young person do to get into the business? I said, your young person tries very hard to think of something else they'd like to do as much as this because the fallout rate is so frightening. Mm. And if they want to do it enough, they will persevere and they will have a go, but you've got to want it more than anything in life. And because the, the dropout rate is huge, about 98%, the number of people coming out of drama school who actually continue working after 10 years is tiny. These days there are... Certain parts for older women, aren't there? Yes, because thank I know goodness. people have complained. But yes. in more recent years, there's been more work for there older has. actors, really. And people are campaigning for there to be more because if you look at the matinee audience today, they will be senior citizens, a lot of them, because they've got the time to come to matinees. They're retired. And I think that people are starting to realise that our theatre goers want to see people representing their lives. And that's why this play, Quartet, mm. is so perfect because. We are all playing older people who are going slightly dotty. You can't remember. Have you said this before? Have, where did I put my keys? All those things that I'm afraid all of us are going through now. Yes. <laughs> and, and so there's a real recognition factor. And it is a very good laugh out loud show. Although there are, of course, some touching moments too. For, for once, I don't carry the, the comedy. Really, the comedy comes from the other three. My character is the one old person who's fighting it. She thinks there is no future and she is completely negative about the, being in this home. So you see her gradually finding a way through and seeing that there is a way that she can still live every minute to the full because that's what the show's really saying. Just because you're in the last furlong, it can be a pretty good furlong. You've done a few movie shorts in recent years, haven't you? Yes, and I think that's good. I'm very excited by the fact that these... And impressed by young actors who just go out and make movies. It's fascinating because they write little stories and they go online and they find a cameraman and a lighting man, a sound man. And usually these people, because there are an awful lot of people in this business who aren't working every day, will do that for nothing except expenses. They get their, their travel paid and some sandwiches and some smashing little short films are being made. I think it's fantastically impressive. That, But that's what young people have to do now. They've got to create their own work. We never had to do that. So I know you've got a show to do this afternoon. I want to go back when you did a show called End of Part One. Oh yes, End of Part One was a very peculiar piece. It was good fun, but it was it was a sort of off the wall comedy written by David Renwick and Andrew Marshall, both of whom went on to do very illustrious things on the television. I did have to do impressions. You did, and I'm not an impressionist at all. Do you all, remember so who you did or not? I did Princess Anne. Yes. I did Penelope Keith very badly. I did Esther Ransom very well. well. Did go on. I was then. rather good. Can Esther. I, can't, I can't do it now because <laughs> you had to have teeth. Ah, I had these right. wonderful <laughs> teeth made for her and for Princess Anne. And I, I used to play the tapes over and over, I'd record them and play them over and over while I was asleep at night. And I did get Esther Ranson, and then I met her in the lift just after I'd done it. She'd obviously seen it, and she wasn't at all pleased. She, she was wasn't. very. No, no, she was a bit chilly about it. But, was I, she? but I loved it. I'm pretty sure it led to my getting Marlene because Ray Bart who was the producer-director on Only Fills and Horses, loved that show. Did he? But he had also seen me do a one-woman show called Our Kid, which Brian Clemens wrote of, oh, of the Avengers yeah. film about Myra Hindley. So he knew that I could do the two things of the, the you know, the slightly dramatic thing and this comedy stuff. The, the amazing thing about getting Marley in, in Only Fills is I didn't have to meet anybody or audition. They just offered me the part because Ray had seen those two things, which wow. was luck, wasn't it? So I did mention the fact that I would uh, plug some forthcoming gigs. Thank so you. you're at the Theatre Royal Brighton from the 26th of March. That's right. Then yeah. you go to Cambridge from the 3rd of April, Richmond from the 9th of April, and Theatre Royal Bath from the 16th. 
And during that time, I'm terribly excited, but in that time, I'm going to become a grandmother. No. While I'm in Brighton, my son's newish wife is due to present me with a grandson. Really? So I'm very excited about that. <laughs> you being a grandmother? Being a granny. I know. Isn't it fun? Well, Gran, thanks for your time today. <laughs> thanks. I don't mind being called granny. I'm no, looking you're... forward to it greatly. Well, there are... There are... <laughs> Glamorous grandmothers, and you're certainly one of them. Granny Sue. <laughs> yeah. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much for coming all this way, John. It's lovely to see you again. And I'm looking forward to seeing Quartet a bit later on today. Because, I hope you'll um, enjoy it. Because my good friend Paul Nicholas is also in the show. So can I wish your career continued success? And I know sooner or later you're going to have a panto this year, aren't you? Wayne? Yes, so, the talks are underway. Are I don't they? know where it will be yet, but I love panto. As you know, I think it's very important because it's the panto audiences that become our audiences of the future. Would you like to say cheerio as Marley? Well, I'm sorry that Boise ain't here. I know that most people want him to be, but, you know, he don't travel well, so I've left him at home looking after the dog, and it's been ever so nice to talk to you again, John. John Hannam, can't cook, won't cook, but what a sexy voice. Grateful thanks to Sue Holden this. And who said Boise wasn't here? Hello, a Boise here. My full range of quality motors are all equipped with the best sound systems to listen to John Hannam Meets on Isle of Wight Radio. <laughs> That's if you really want to. <clears throat> Keep looking on the Isle of Wight Radio website, the John Hannam website and YouTube for more John Hannam Meets new interviews. Bye-bye for now. I'll invite Radio.